Dear speaker, uh, dear uh, guest participants, my name is Roman Nikolak. I work as an international relations coordinator at the Center for Civil Liberties. And today, in the framework of Ukrainian International Criminal Justice Week, uh, week dedicated to uh, commemorate the June 17 International Criminal Justice Day, a 25th anniversary of Rome Statue, of the International Criminal Court. We host a number of panel discussion and webinars dedicated to international criminal justice system and uh, to international humanitarian law and international criminal law. This webinar will be recorded and you can revisit the recording for your educational uh, purposes. I will be moderating the event and uh, Center for Civil Liberties Associate, Ms. Louise Nielsen will uh, observe and navigate uh, the q &A session. You can ask your question uh, by typing them into the chat or at the allocated time, raise a hand in Zoom and voice your question uh, by yourself. If you are new to our platform, I will briefly explain that Center for Civil Liberties is a based NGO, Ukrainian NGO. We are operating from uh, 2007. And, uh, and last year, we received the Nobel uh, Peace uh, Prize. So today, our uh, guest speaker is Professor David Crane, and he will speak on the establishment of a special tribunal for Ukraine with regard to the Russian crime of aggression, the core international violation, one of the most serious international crimes that exist in international relations. relations. Uh, Professor Crane is also a part of a group of distinguished uh, scholars, uh, legal professionals and legal practitioners who have put together a research document for a special tribunal for Ukraine. He is a founder of a similar tribunal in Sierra Leone, meaning Professor Crane is a best suited person for today's lectures because he have done the special tribunal for the crime of aggression before, and his experience, guidelines, and leadership is a core for the success of Ukrainian case. Professor Crane will uh, outline the seven practical steps on how to set an uh, aggression uh, tribunal. Uh, Professor Crane, the floor is yours. Well, thank you very much, Roman, and it's a real pleasure to be here with you uh, today. Uh, this is uh, an important time, uh, not just for Ukraine, certainly, but it's also an important time for all mankind, all democracies. Uh, we must face down uh, aggression uh, through the rule of law, period. And we're going to do that. The, the byword, the touchword is accountability. And it's my pleasure and honor to be with you to talk about this. And I'm, I'm looking forward to hearing your points of view and questions at the end of my talk. So what we're going to do today is talk about accountability uh, for this aggression. Uh, it cannot stand. Since the invasion in February of 2022, the Russian Federation has committed numerous international crimes, some of which have not been seen since the medieval days. Barbarism. <clears throat> Who would have thought in a world of the United Nations that we would see a sitting member of the Security Council illegally invade a member state, Ukraine. I've been around the world a lot. I've seen a lot. Uh, I would never thought that we would see this today. So it's happened, let's deal with it. Now, where are we right now regarding the rule of law? Uh, in Ukraine, in Europe and internationally, the world has come together to in fact hold Vladimir Putin uh, and his political and military leadership accountable for the invasion of Ukraine. And they will be held accountable. So we've seen the International Criminal Court issue an arrest warrant for war crimes. Uh, that is a permanent mark on Vladimir Putin. Uh, there are no statute of limitations, as you know, related to international crimes. And so for the rest of his natural life, he is uh, marked as a war criminal. 
And so he can't travel. As you've already seen, he's not going to South Africa for the BRIC conference. He realizes that if he leaves Ukraine, other than for their aider and a better in, uh, uh, in other countries, uh, such as Belarus, and the bottom line is he can't travel. And if he does, he could be arrested uh, on that arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court. So that in some ways, we all should take heart that uh, having been one of the founders of uh, modern international criminal law, we now have, we've been doing this now for 25 years or so. We have the jurisprudence, we have the law, we have the proper rules of procedure and evidence. Uh, and we also have the experience to take down a sitting head of state for war crimes, crimes against humanity, and of course, aggression and perhaps even genocide. So that's what I wanna to talk to you today about is the practical aspects of creating a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. But before we do that, uh, let's just kind of put this situation, these circumstances that we're living in kind of in a context. You know, we're just coming out of what I call the, the bloody 20th century where we have seen over a hundred million human beings die at the hands of their own governments. And as a result of that, we see the development of international uh, criminal law to hold uh, heads of state accountable for what they do to their own citizens. And there, and there are three phases of what I call accountability. The first phase was the beginning phase, the uh, Nuremberg Tokyo phase of 1945, where we had the mil International Military Tribunal uh, in Nuremberg uh, and Tokyo, where, we, where the world took its first small steps to seek accountability under the rule of law. And that was a huge step. Now, of course, through the Cold War, uh, that kind of uh, went blank. But in the 1990s, we see what we call the second phase of accountability, the age of accountability, and where we see the, the major tribunals created in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, Sierra Leone. And then we even see the establishment of a permanent world international uh, criminal court. That's the, uh, the accountability phase, uh, the age of accountability. And that that lasted till about 2015. And then we see the rise of the strongman, which I call the age of the strongman, of which we are still in, but we're also seeing the world turn back saying, how do we deal with these strongmen? Uh, they realize that they can't use force, so let's use the rule of law. So even though we have three phases from Nuremberg to the age of accountability in the 90s and early 2000s, and now we're in age of strongmen where we see 12 and 13 strong men around the world turning away from the rule of law and, and using their own techniques to stay in political control. We now see with the aggression by Vladimir Putin, one of those strong men uh, against Ukraine, we see the world stopping and saying, wait a minute, this cannot stand. We have to use the rule of law to in fact push back aggression uh, and hold them accountable. So, you know, right now we're kind of in a transitionary phase. For a while there, it looked like modern international criminal law was kind of, uh, frankly, uh, uh, being pushed back, pushed away by nation states. But now we see the world turning to the rule of law, to international criminal law, uh, and the experience that we do have to hold Vladimir Putin and his henchmen accountable. So that's where we are today. So what's being done about all of these crimes? Well, of course, there's a, uh, the International Criminal Court has jurisdiction over war crimes and crimes against humanity, but because of a you know, procedural uh, and statutory quirks within the system, uh, they, we don't have jurisdiction. They don't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So uh, what do we do? Well, we, there are several ways we can deal with the aggression. It has to happen, and it will happen. Uh, there are three kind of models that are being discussed. You have probably heard about all of them. Uh, the first model is an interesting uh, uh, concept of a hybrid between Ukraine and the international community uh, located in Ukraine dealing with the crime of aggression. An interesting idea, but the challenge with this idea uh, is that uh, we have head of state immunity. And at the international level, uh, in the court that I was a part of and founded, the UN Special Court for Sierra Leone, we showed the world and through jurisprudence that a head of state, a sitting head of state who commits international crimes while they are 
a sitting head of state do not have head of state immunity at the international level. So the challenge with holding something about aggression with Ukraine in Ukraine using international and domestic law runs smack dab into head of state immunity and say, who do we want to hold accountable here? Well, we have to hold Vladimir Putin accountable. This was his idea. This was his policy. He is the one that directed that this happened starting in 2014 and all the way to the present day, this aggression. And so we have to hold him accountable. Now, we certainly can hold uh, his political and military leadership accountable as well, but we have to get to the core problem, and that is President Vladimir Putin. The model, the hybrid model that is called, uh, will, will run smack dab and have problems with holding Vladimir Putin accountable for aggression. The second idea that's being floated around is kind of a regional European centric kind of idea where uh, uh, the crime of aggression uh, will be dealt with uh, at a regional level. Uh, okay, another interesting idea and a concept, uh, but the challenge again is, is that through the jurisprudence, it's not clear to me and others of my colleagues uh, whether, uh, again, head of state immunity will apply to this situation. I tend to think it will because we have no jurisprudence, no law related to saying that it does not. And so the defense counsel can raise head of state immunity and say that my client Vladimir Putin is immune because he is a sitting head of state. So where does that leave us? Well, again, we have the third option, an option that I've been working on now for uh, over a year. You have most of the materials that we have put together related to creating a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. The team that I am a part of have put together a sample UN General Assembly resolution recommending to the Secretary General that he enter into a bilateral agreement with Ukraine to establish the special tribunal for Ukraine uh, on the crime of aggression. We have actually have that model. You have a copy of that model. Uh, we've also uh, laid out the, the procedure, the process by which we would establish a special tribunal for Ukraine. Something to take heart of, and this is important, we have done this before successfully. Uh, we've actually taken down a sitting head of state for war crimes and crimes against humanity. That is President Charles Taylor of Liberia, who sits now for the rest of his life in a maximum security prison in the United Kingdom. So we've done this before. We have the people who have done this before. They can do it again. And so this is the model of which I am uh, going to show you today, the international part. So we've had, we have three ideas, a hybrid in Ukraine, a more regional approach in Europe, and the international approach, which is what I am strongly advocating, and of which head of state immunity does not apply because in the prosecutor, me versus Taylor, uh, the bottom line is, is that uh, uh, head of state immunity doesn't apply. And so we took down President Charles Taylor, uh, and uh, he now is in jail for the rest of his life for what he did to the people of Sierra Leone. And we can do the very same thing with Vladimir Putin and what he has done uh, to the people of Ukraine. So what I have laid out are the seven practical steps of how to set up a special tribunal for Ukraine. Uh, you have a copy of that. And so what we'll do now, I'll ask my colleague to put those slides uh, before you, and we'll just go through those slides, uh, and then we'll take your questions. If you'll wait just a second as it comes up, there they are, all right. Standing by here for this. Yep, can you see the slides? I can, and so let's go ahead to the next slide. Let's go to the next slide. All right, the next slide talks about, and what I really want to do is highlight the fact that in reality, uh, there are aspects to considering uh, 
taking down a sitting head of state. Uh, they're political, diplomatic, legal, practical, as well as cultural considerations when you are thinking about taking down a head of state. And one of the questions that we have to, to ask ourselves as we are thinking about setting up a, a tribunal to hold a head of state accountable is, uh, uh, is the justice we seek, the international community, the justice that the people of Ukraine want? And we, that was a question that I asked uh, my staff in, uh, and the international community when we were setting up uh, the, the tribunal, uh, the court in Sierra Leone in West Africa, the very same question. Uh, they may have a different idea of what justice is, but we have to be humble enough that perhaps the Ukrainian people also have an idea of what is a just result. So again, we always have to keep that in our back of our mind and we keep have to, as we start establishing the court, is working directly with our Ukrainian colleagues and the victims as to what this court should look like. Let's go to the next slide, please. I'm not getting the next slide. Step one. Well, step one is, uh, these are questions that we ask ourselves as we are thinking about how best to have a tribunal. Uh, uh, where is the atrocity zone? Obviously it's in Ukraine. Uh, what kind of international crimes are being committed? War crimes, crimes against humanity, obviously. Aggression, which is what we would focus on, as well as possible genocide. Who's committing these crimes? Obviously, we have the Russian armed forces, we have the political leadership also very much involved, and we have, interestingly enough, other countries who are, in fact, uh, committing these crimes, aiding and abetting these crimes against the people of Ukraine, Belarus, Iran, North Korea. So we have to be thinking about that. Uh, also, one of the things is we need to, questions we need to ask ourselves is, uh, does the domestic law cover these crimes? And the answer is, uh, the prosecutor general Ukraine is working very hard to hold individuals accountable under domestic law, and that's important, and that should continue. But the crime of aggression uh, has to be done at the international level, particularly uh, related to uh, uh, the crime uh, of aggression. Uh, and these are other questions such as, right, well, what about jurisdiction? Of course, this is a court of law, and so a court has to have the appropriate jurisdiction. As I've said, uh, at the international level, the International Criminal Court has the jurisdiction over the war crimes, crimes against humanity, and perhaps genocide, whereas they don't have it uh, related to aggression. And so that's why we're setting up the special tribunal for Ukraine uh, on the crime of aggression. Uh, there's nothing wrong with it overlapping. Uh, the two, uh, all the courts, the Prosecutor General and the Ukraine Domestic Law, the International Criminal Court, uh, working on war crimes and crimes against humanity, and then the special tribunal also can work together, in fact, support each other, sharing information, data, as well as evidence. So these are kind of the step one questions that you ask when you are establishing this. Well, step two is then, okay, well, all right. And we've talked about this already this morning. Well, taking all of these questions and these answers and these concepts, uh, what's the appropriate justice mechanism? Uh, related to particularly holding individuals uh, accountable. Certainly it's domestic, potentially regional and international. And of course, if we think about international, you know, what type of court would it be? Uh, well, of course, the International Criminal Court does have jurisdiction related to uh, this, but at the end of the day, uh, they don't have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. So, uh, what are other kind of concepts at the international level have we put together? When well, Rwanda and in Yugoslavia, you know, we had ad hoc tribunals set up by the Security Council to specifically deal with the atrocities committed in those regions of the world. Well, in this situation, and it's unprecedented and unheard of, we have a permanent member of the Security Council who is the focus of the investigations and the crimes. And so we can't use the Security Council to establish this tribunal. And so what we have to do then is look to the General Assembly uh, to create uh, this uh, tribunal. And so that's what we would do here related to that is we would set up uh, basically uh, what we would probably call a hybrid international war crimes tribunal uh, that was similar to the one that I set up uh, with the UN Special Tribunal 
uh, court in, in Sierra Leone. So the question then we ask ourselves is, uh, what are the jurisdictional and immunity things that impact uh, on uh, our work dealing with accountability? Uh, and of course, certainly the jurisdictional aspect is, is the International Criminal Court can't deal with aggression. And so, uh, uh, excuse me for one moment. No problem. Just to reconfirm, can you see slides, uh, Luis? Okay. Okay, well, thank you for your patience. Again, uh, the things that we have to be concerned about is we're, is we're finishing step two as we create the Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression uh, is uh, uh, our concern related to jurisdiction. We can deal with the jurisdiction because at the international level, we do have jurisdiction over the crime of aggression. Uh, as of course, we also have immunities, which the inter at the international level, because of prosecutor versus Charles Taylor, uh, Vladimir Putin is not immune under the head of state immunity issue related to his international crimes that he has committed. Well, let's go to step three. We've done step one, step two, answered questions, got our four corners. So what is the way that we should do this? How do we in fact create the tribunal? We've talked about a regional arrangement. The challenge is, is the head of state immunity issue. Well, what about the United Nations auspices? I think this is the way to go. This is the kind of thing that we need to use. We can't use the Security Council, as I've said, so we have to go through and look at uh, considering the General Assembly uh, to set up that uh, uh, tribunal. And so this is what we're, where we're going with this, is that we would, we would, and you have a copy of the draft resolution, is that we would seek the General Assembly uh, to uh, recommend, because of course the General Assembly cannot direct, but they can recommend to the Secretary General uh, that he enter into negotiations. And we also have laid out uh, a copy of the statute by which could be negotiated between Ukraine uh, and the United Nations. So let's go to uh, the next step, step four. Well, step four uh, is that we do in fact uh, create a resolution uh, that in fact we do work with uh, setting up this bi bilateral agreement with, uh, with Ukraine through a statute. Uh, and we'll talk about the mandate in a second. Uh, and with that, we would also be working on and developing the rules of procedure and evidence. Obviously, we would uh, probably model it after the UN Special Tribunal uh, in Sierra Leone, so that, that we've already done this, as I've told you before. So that there's no reason to, as we say in, in my country, uh, reinvent the wheel, so to speak. Let's use what we already done successfully uh, and use it to seek justice for the people of Ukraine related to the crime of aggression. So as we are dealing with the statute, as we're developing the rules of procedure and evidence, we also have to talk, think about, well, how, do we, how are we going to fund uh, the tribunal? And we certainly can do this. Uh, the options are, <coughs> excuse me, assessed. In other words, we ask, uh, we assess do member states of the United Nations uh, monies to help this, or we do voluntary, as we don't wanna do mandatory, and so we would ask uh, interested states to voluntarily contribute money uh, and other items to uh, establish the special tribunal for Ukraine and the crime of aggression. Uh, this is what I am advocating. This is what we did in Sierra Leone with the UN Special Court for Sierra Leone is just that, is that we ask member states to in fact voluntarily uh, contribute money, but also uh, other types of things, for example, uh, in, in West Africa, when we were establishing the special court for Sierra Leone, uh, for example, the Chinese government gave us uh, $300,000 uh, worth of furniture and those kind of things. Uh, countries can also uh, provide uh, members of the court. Uh, they can provide other types of uh, support related to information technology, those sorts of things. So the voluntary aspect of funding and supporting the special tribunal uh, is one that I would say has been done successfully before and one that I would advocate uh, this time around. But because of the fact that it's voluntarily, we would want to establish uh, in our step four, 
a management committee uh, of states who are contributing to the special tribunal for Ukraine. Uh, and we would also make the Ukraine an ex officio member of the management committee. In other words, what we're doing is we are uh, having the UN management committee uh, monitor the expenditures uh, of the funds and the development uh, of the mandate for uh, the court. So another thing that we need to think about is that the members of the court who uh, joined the court to seek justice for the people of Ukraine on the crime of aggression would be employed by the court and not by the United Nations. Uh, we did this uh, in Sierra Leone and it was very effective. In other words, they're not employees of the United Nations, which in some cases takes a year to become. If they're members of the court, we can bring them on quickly and efficiently uh, within weeks to start our work related to seeking justice. So that is also a very strong recommendation is that they're employees of the court and not of the United Nations. So what, is the, what would be the mandate of uh, the Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression? Let's go to the next slide. Well, here is the mandate. And really when you create a mandate, you have to think about uh, jurisdiction, uh, subject matter jurisdiction, in personam jurisdiction, and temporal jurisdiction. So let me read the mandate of what I suggest would be the Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. And I, you know, we wrote this uh, specifically just uh, very carefully on uh, 20 to 25 years of experience. The mandate of the Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression would be to prosecute those who bear the greatest responsibility for perpetrating the crime of aggression and associated crimes by the Russian Federation and other member states of the United Nations against the Republic of Ukraine from 2014 to the present. It addresses subject matter jurisdiction. It talks about aggression and aiding and abetting aggression. The in personam jurisdiction, in other words, the individuals that the mandate shows who we need to investigate, indict, and prosecute, would be senior political and military leader, leadership of the Russian Federation and other associated United Nations member states. You know, we have more uh, member states, as I've said, in the aiding and abetting that are uh, causing uh, the, the terror and the international crimes uh, against Ukraine. And that is Belarus, North Korea, and Iran. And so, you know, we should be considering also holding them accountable related to aiding and abetting uh, the aggression against Ukraine. And then, of course, the temporal jurisdiction means that, you know, what time, what's the time frame by which we're going to hold uh, these individuals accountable? And that is from 2014 to the present, so that we bring in uh, the annexation of Crimea, which was clearly uh, an act of aggression and of which we would have jurisdiction over related to uh, prosecuting Vladimir Putin and his senior political and military leadership. So that's the mandate. All right, let's have the next slide. Uh, let's. Uh, that should be step, yeah, step five. Uh, all right, well, at this point in time, let's put this new tribunal together. And so what we need to do uh, is to begin the process of selecting uh, a chief prosecutor and a registrar, a registrar being uh, the person who runs the administrative aspect uh, of the tribunal. Because we have such a vast experience in this area, uh, the recommendation is, is that anybody who is being considered to be prosecutor or registrar, and we'll talk more about the judges, uh, should have already been a chief prosecutor and should have been a registrar uh, at the international level. And so we would report, uh, uh, appoint a former chief prosecutor, a former registrar. Uh, they would have the rank of undersecretary general they would set up their offices quickly and temporarily uh, in UN uh, and begin to start uh, through the management committee receiving voluntary funds uh, so that they could start their work. Frankly, you know, this is what we did in Sierra Leone and it worked perfectly. So the bottom line is we've got the experience, let's select an experienced chief prosecutor and experienced registrar so that they can begin their work starting at the UN headquarters in New York and then moving quickly uh, towards The Hague. Next slide. 
Well, step six, okay, there's seven steps. We're moving through this. Again, uh, we can certainly talk more about this in detail. You do have other, other appropriate paperwork as well as these seven steps. But as you can see, there's a logic to it. Uh, uh, there's a process. Uh, we've gone through all of these steps before and we've done it successfully. So the prosecutor uh, develops an overall strategic plan. How are we going to do this from beginning, middle, and end? So the strategic plan is a little bit different than his uh, strategy related to who he's going to investigate, who he's going to indict, when he's going to indict, and what crimes, et cetera. But at least at this point in time, we're building a plan, a sheet of music by which everyone plays off of so that we can show the world the management committee, the people of Ukraine, here is where we're going to start. Here where we're, we're going to be in a couple of months. And here are where we're going to be when we know that the time is that we're done. That's very important because it allows people to understand uh, what is going to be happening related to accomplishing the mandate. Of course, the registrar begins dealing with and setting up his office, hiring people uh, that would be working for the court, again, not for the United Nations. And there would be a traveling back and forth to and do several things, one of which, and I think this is really critical, is that we have to establish a very strong relationship with our friends at the International Criminal Court. We're kind of doing the same thing. We're holding President Putin accountable for what he's done, along with his political leadership and his military leadership. And so these two uh, international courts, the International Criminal Court, uh, as well as the uh, Special Tribunal, would work very, very closely together uh, in sharing information, evidence, and even personnel uh, related to that. So that the two uh, international courts would be located in The Hague working together. Now, of course, we would certainly set up a liaison office uh, in Ukraine where we would work out of as well. But the bottom line is, is that the two uh, courts would work closely together in seeking justice for the people of Ukraine. And I think this is really important. At the end of the day, what's all of this about? It's about seeking justice for victims of atrocity. And in this case, uh, it is the people uh, of Ukraine. We can't lose uh, sight of that. Well, one of the other things that we would want to do is not only develop a good relationship with our friends at the International Criminal Court, but we would also want to make sure that we have the ability to work with the European Union, uh, NATO, as well as Ukraine. And so we would uh, develop uh, methodologies by which we would keep each other currently and fully informed so that we could mutually support each other and understand uh, what each and every entity here uh, is doing so that we work together, not uh, against each other related to our work of securing Europe, making sure that Russia is held in check, but also seeking justice for the people of Ukraine. Well, let's go to the last step, step seven. All right. Uh, the Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the Crime of Aggression begins its work. Uh, the prosecutor is now moving to The Hague. He begins working it. He starts developing his prosecutorial plan. He begins debriefing his investigators and his prosecutors of how that's going to happen. Uh, and we do this by, uh, as we did in uh, West Africa with the UN Special Court for Sierra Leone, we developed task forces. So if I was the chief prosecutor, I would... Uh, I have four task forces uh, composed of trial counsel, investigators, and support staff uh, investigating Putin for aggression. But also then we would also uh, be investigating his political leadership and another task force, as well as military leadership and another task force related to aggression and aiding and abetting aggression. And then we'd also have a fourth task force related to investigating associated member states, member our mandate, so that we'd be looking at uh, the complicity of Belarus, Iran, and North Korea, uh, and their aiding and abetting the aggression of the Russian Federation. Now, throughout all of this, as the prosecutor is starting his work in seeking justice for the people of Ukraine, is that the registrar throughout all of this is putting together uh, the buildings, the vehicles, the personnel, monitoring the finance uh, and bringing on uh, various uh, the judges, uh, what have you. So again, uh, that's step seven. But there are some other considerations before we take your questions. Next slide. Well, considerations of note. In other words, uh, let's do this efficiently and effectively. We did this 
uh, in, uh, in West Africa with the special uh, court for Sierra Leone. Uh, because we had a plan, we worked the plan, uh, we had a budget. I could tell uh, anybody at any given time what we were doing, why we were doing it, where we were going, uh, and what kind of monies we were expending. So this is very important, and it gives the voluntary member states who are giving us money a feeling that their money is being uh, efficiently and effectively uh, spent. So what we do is we bring people on as needed. In other words, we just don't bring a whole bunch of people in uh, to the special tribunal. We bring them on as they are needed in phases uh, using contractors. We use secondments. In other words, uh, we have countries donate personnel who have a lot of experience in a particular area. Uh, we use interns and also we have supporting consortiums. Uh, like I developed a, an academic consortium of uh, 12 of the world's best law schools supporting me related to research and writing uh, in our work uh, there in West Africa. We can do this uh, with Ukraine. Now, one of the things that's important, and frankly, the weak link to international criminal law are its judges. And so we do now have, finally, experienced, learned judges who can be brought on. But we don't need to bring the judges on immediately related to doing their work. We bring them on as we need them. And so we don't we appoint them, but we don't actually bring them on and start paying them until they are needed related to pretrial matters, trial matters, uh, and appellate matters. And so what, I, what I'm looking at here uh, as far as we would have uh, one trial chamber uh, with three judges and, al and alternates. Uh, and then we'd also have one appellate chamber uh, made up of uh, associate justices who would in fact serve as an on as needed basis related to legal issues. Uh, but again, and this is important, like we did with the prosecutor on the registrar, uh, to be a judge on the special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression, you must have been an international judge before. So that this will automatically bring a lot of efficiency and effectiveness into uh, the, the workforce uh, related to seeking justice for the people of Ukraine. This is very, very critical. We cannot have judges who have never been an international judge before. When we were setting up the tribunals in U Yugoslavia, Rwanda, and even Sierra Leone, uh, most of the judges uh, did not have international experience. And that was a real challenge uh, for those of us who were seeking justice is that the judges were problematic at times because they actually, and frankly, didn't know what they were doing. So now that we, we have experienced international judges, uh, we can do this. Other considerations. Next slide. One of the things, and we didn't have this challenge much in Rwanda, Yugoslavia, or Sierra Leone, is physical and personal security uh, of the court and its personnel. We have a, uh, a potential client or a potential indictee, Vladimir Putin, and his entire Russian Federation. You know, they have the ability to destroy the special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. Uh, they could assassinate. Uh, various key members of the court. They can bomb uh, the court itself. And so we have to, as we begin to consider uh, the seven steps that we're putting this together, is we have to have the court itself in, a, in appropriate, secure locations. Uh, the buildings need to be hardened, uh, be able to withstand uh, attacks. Uh, my thinking is, is that we uh, uh, put the special tribunal uh, uh, in a NATO base in the Netherlands uh, to ensure that it could be defended. The vehicles need to be armored. There also has to be personal protection of all the key members uh, of the tribunal. We have to protect the evidence. We have to put the evidence in a concrete bunker so that Vladimir Putin uh, uh, doesn't try to destroy the evidence that we're gathering against him. I mean, this is a real world challenge. This is a real world problem and has to be considered as we set up the special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. This is just based on practical experience that we learned in West Africa. Next slide. All right, uh, we do this in phases, all right? So that, uh, again, this would be a general look at what a, a general strategy would be for uh, executing the mandate of the special tribunal. And phase one would be set up. I would estimate that this would take about two months. Uh, then we would have the invest phase two would be the investigatory phase and an initial indictment. Uh, 
In other words, I, I, I would, based on my considered experience and my judgment, uh, we would have a, an indictment against Vladimir Putin and others uh, within the year. And it has to be done that way. I think it's very, very important. Well, you say, okay, well, that's fine. Uh, but what do we do once we have the indictment? Well, again, uh, that's why I have the line there, because then at this point in time, it becomes more of a political issue. We, he is indicted for aggression. His political and uh, military senior leadership are indicted for uh, aggression or, and aiding and abetting aggression, et cetera. So what we do then is the political decision then is, is to uh, wait or see what happens related to uh, actually prosecuting them. And of course, there would be a pretrial phase, a trial phase, and an appellate phase. And then, of course, there is a post-trial and a residual phase that would be uh, determined uh, later on. That is something that is out of our control at this time. But I can assure you that if we had a mandate and it was, and we had a statute that was entered into a bilateral treaty between Ukraine and the United Nations, uh, we would have this court set up within two months and within a year, we would have indictments of all of the key individuals related to the crime of aggression. This isn't an academic theory. Uh, this is my considered judgment based on my decades worth of experience related in doing this. It can be done with a proper strategy uh, uh, and a proper focus uh, by the court as well as the international community. So again, we can do this. Uh, and again, you know, when I indicted President Charles Taylor and others, we prosecuted the others. And this is important also, we tend to forget this. Everybody's kind of focused on Putin. Uh, but what about the, the political leadership, like the foreign minister, Lavrov, uh, or the minister of defense, the former ministers of defense? There's been many as they've been rotating through. Uh, you know, we would be prosecuting them as well for aggression and not just Putin himself. So uh, we may be able to get Lavrov and others uh, and to also to include Mindya, uh, we would prosecute them. And eventually uh, there will be a political moment or circumstance by which uh, the, uh, the Russians would hand over Vladimir Putin for a fair and open trial, but he would be prosecuted for aggression. So, you know, we can do this. We can do this within a year. Uh, we can set the marker. We can set the signal uh, to the world uh, that uh, no head of state can do something like this. So last slide. We have done this before successfully. We have to do this. We cannot let him get away with this. We have to do something. I advocate strongly uh, for an international approach to this, but regardless of what the world finally decides, whether it be a hybrid model or a regional model or an international model, there has to be something related to dealing with Putin's aggression. If we do not, it's going to be a very, very different world that we, believe, uh, we will be living in. 2023 will be one of those seminal years that people will look back on saying, we did this, the world is a safer place, or we didn't do this. And now the world uh, is uh, being challenged by the many strong men uh, around the world. Remember, I talked about the age of the strong men. But again, we have done this before. We have the capability of doing it again. I hope that showing you these seven steps of how it could be done could give you some kind of heart, to take heart uh, that this can be done. And, uh, and so let's do this, shall we, uh, together. So with that, that concludes my remarks and I look forward to your comments uh, and, and your questions, please. Professor Crane, thank you. I uh, stop uh, sharing the screen. And uh, Ms. Louise Nielsen, please uh, proceed with the Q&A session. Hello, everyone, and thank you, David, for that comprehensive overview. Uh, we have some exciting questions in the chat. Uh, so I will start with some of the questions that we've received online. And then, of course, remember, you welcome all participants to put your questions uh, by raising your hand uh, in the directly in this Zoom call as well. Uh, so. Uh, the first question goes like this. The ICTY, that's the Special Tribunal for Yugoslavia, that was held, uh, Statute Article 7.3 indicates, a superior shall be criminally responsible for the crimes committed by subordinates if they knew or had reason to know that the subordinate was about to commit such acts. How would this principle apply in Ukraine? 
especially with the complexity of command responsibility in both formal and irregular armed forces? Great question. It goes to what we call command responsibility. Uh, and a head of state, if they are head of their armed forces under the Russian constitution, Vladimir Putin is the commander in chief of all Russian Federation armed forces. And so he is directly responsible, individually criminally responsible for each and every act that his armed forces commit against the people of Ukraine. I did the same thing in West Africa with Charles Taylor. Uh, and of course, uh, uh, that has been a strong uh, legal principle related to holding in individuals accountable for war crimes and crimes against humanity, what have you, uh, related to command responsibility. So Rush, so at this point, legally, Vladimir Putin is individually criminally responsible for each and every act of each Russian soldier, uh, airman, or sailor who was committing crimes against uh, the people of Ukraine. Charles Taylor was charged with war crimes for the murder rape, maiming, and mutilation of over 1.2 million human beings. And so uh, command responsibility, uh, obviously the statute in, in uh, uh, Yugoslavia, there's one in Rwanda, there's one in Sierra Leone, there's one in, uh, for the special tribunal if we need it. But command responsibility is a hard rock legal principle that we hold heads of state responsible for uh, perpetrating international crimes against other peoples. It's a good question. Great, thank you for that answer. And does that apply then also to the Wagner uh, paramilitary group? You, you know, it's interesting, you know, uh, this is the first where we've actually had a major mercenary group, uh, Putin's personal army in combat against the armed forces of another country. Uh, generally speaking, using mercenaries is illegal. Uh, but again, in some ways, one can argue they're illegal combatants. So yeah, they will be held responsible uh, for their acts uh, related to uh, the, the invasion of Ukraine. Great, thank you. Then we have another question, and this is coming from Andre in the chat. Please comment on Germany's proposal to create a hybrid model of the Special International Tribunal for Russian's Aggression Against Ukraine. The idea of this model of the tribunal is that the tribunal is created and operates on the basis of the national legislation of Ukraine and jurisdiction, but with the involvement of an international element for its construction and operation. Uh, currently, Ukraine completely rejects the hybrid model of a special international tribunal. The Ukrainian side advocates the creation of a full-fledged international tribunal based on an international treaty. Please provide your comments. Well, again, as we talked about, there are three options, one of which is the one that was just mentioned, kind of a hybrid model, as it's called. Uh, there's another European kind of regional approach, and then there's the international approach. The challenge with using the hybrid uh, approach is that uh, you can't do anything about Putin. And he's the one that started this whole thing. So it's a waste of time. Uh, it makes politi politicians feel good that they're, quote, doing something, uh, but in reality, they're not doing much at all. Uh, really, the true, uh, most efficient and effective way of holding Putin and his uh, senior political and military uh, uh, members accountable for the aggression uh, is an international approach. Great, and that has to do with the head of state immunity that that's revoked them. Yes. Right. That's clear. Um, another comment. Professor Crane, in your lecture, you suggested that the special tribunal for Sierra Leone uh, was deemed successful. Could you elucidate the metrics used to assess its success and how they might potentially be employed in the Ukrainian context? In addition, you mentioned the International Criminal Court might undertake similar initiatives as those of the special tribunal. Given the substantial financial considerations, do you believe such an approach is justifiable, especially when the funds could be alternatively directed towards the reconstruction of Ukraine? Good questions, important questions, questions that have to be dealt with. The reason why I knew that our, we are working in, the, in Sierra Leone and West Africa were effective is I went out in our outreach program, our town hall program, and asked the people of Sierra Leone what they wanted. Is the justice we seek the justice they want? We got their perspectives. We listened to them for three years, walking the countryside. Uh, of course, also, also there was a poll at the end of the work of the special tribe uh, court for Sierra Leone, where two thirds of the people of Sierra Leone said that the tribunal uh, was effective in seeking justice for them. And so I think that's a pretty good uh, question related to this. Now, of course, the question related to uh, uh, monies, what have you, 
uh, Special Tribunal for Ukraine on the Crime of Aggression is an efficient and effective model by which we can uh, uh, use monies and uh, effectively uh, and, and uh, efficiently. In other words, uh, we don't need $100 million to do this. Uh, I have told people that we could literally, in the year that I'm talking about, uh, from starting to indictment of President Putin uh, and his henchmen, uh, a year. And I'm looking at about approximately $15 million related to setting that up. And that's very similar to what we did when we were in, uh, in West Africa. And so we can do this. Now, $15 million to you and me is a lot of money, but the point is, is in the overall scheme of things, it's very, uh, it's not that much money. And so uh, it would not detract from uh, other important aspects of seeking justice for the people of Ukraine. It's not just the justice, but also rebuilding Ukraine and also uh, reparations uh, for what they have gone through. Uh, and so well, that's why it's also important. And why I always say is that the uh, reason we do all of this is for the victims of the atrocity. And so this would be the people of Ukraine. So uh, I don't think that in my opinion, this would not detract for, for uh, contributions and efforts related to the rebuilding of Ukraine, uh, et cetera. So uh, you know, that's my considered opinion, but it's a good question and one that needs to be talked about and addressed. Yeah, thank you, Sonia, for this question. And one might add that uh, the tribunal and accountability is quite important for, sust for a sustainable uh, rebuilding of Ukraine. As well, well, you know, if I could, I could just point out, you know, once we did our work in Sierra Leone, uh, even though Sierra Leone has been challenged by the pandemic and with uh, other diseases, uh, the actual the, st the political stability of Sierra Leone has been has been permanently set, and so that uh, Sierra Leone has been able to slowly but surely uh, work its way out of that horror story. Uh, and uh, it's, a, it's, a, it's just a good uh, model to look at saying that the rule of law actually started the cornerstone by which a country can be built. Beautifully put. We have another question from Anastasia, and she's saying, thank you for the great lecture. And could you elaborate on the mechanism of the UN General Assembly initiating the creation of the tribunal? Specifically, how many UN state members need to support it in order for the tribunal to be considered internationally legitimate? Well, again, uh, the UN General Assembly uh, can meet an extraordinary session. It has. It's done it already four times related to Ukraine. And over 141 nations, and on the average, have, uh, have uh, passed these resolutions condemning what has been happened uh, by the Russian Federation in Ukraine in various aspects, so that there's already a concern by the General Assembly. Uh, uh, again, it would take uh, two-thirds of the General Assembly to recommend to the Secretary General uh, that he enter into bilateral agreement with uh, Ukraine to set up the court, of which you have the model to do that, uh, that we've sent out to you. Uh, so that it's at this point in time, uh, we've done the legal and procedural part of this really at the end of the day. And now you've seen the seven steps, uh, how we get to go from A to Z from uh, set up to indictment in a year. So, but now it's a political decision. The world has to decide whether they're going to stand up to the aggression internationally and hold Vladimir Putin accountable. Uh, this has to be done, as I've already said. Uh, so uh, that's kind of the procedure. Uh, the General Assembly can only recommend, it cannot direct, as I've said, uh, but that is an approach. There's also some discussions, interesting enough, uh, can we do it in a way that we would have a resolution passed that would just say, calling on member states to create a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression, not actually recommending to the secretary general, but just calling on member states uh, to come together, enter into a bilateral agreement uh, with, uh, with Ukraine uh, and set it up that way. Uh, that would probably just take a majority vote to do that. That's not the best way to do that. And the reason why is we have to show the Russian Federation and those who aid and abet the Russian Federation, Belarus, Ukraine, uh, and Iran, I mean, Belarus, North Korea, and Iran, uh, that two thirds of the world at a minimum have already said, you can't do this. You're gonna be held accountable. It's a political punch in the face, which we have to do. So again, uh, the approach that we are advocating and the seven steps that we've shown you, uh, are, I really do think is, is the most efficient, effective and legally supportable and politically manageable uh, solution. Great. 
Yes, and then we have one uh, more question, and you have in part answered this, but in your opinion, which model of the tribunal is most likely? Well, again, you know, I live in a real world. I've been doing this a long time. It is a political decision. Uh, right now, there are major countries that tend to lean towards uh, the hybrid model uh, to include the United States, United Kingdom, uh, France, Germany. Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, but, you know, it's interesting. Uh, yeah, they will understand that they may end up being on the wrong side of the fence, on the wrong side of history. Just recently, 38 member states, member states of the core group have clearly called upon a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. Uh, it, it remains to be seen. I am not sure whether we'll get a special tribunal for Ukraine on the crime of aggression. I just have to be honest with you. Uh, but as you can see, and it's so important that all of us advocate, write about, talk about among our colleagues, friends, that this is the way to go. Because again, uh, a hybrid just isn't going to work. It's just a, a political uh, uh, solution to something that will not hold Vladimir Putin accountable. We have to hold Vladimir Putin personally accountable uh, for his aggression. Mm. And are there any key member states that you see we should focus on when we advocate for this that will be key in that decision making? Well, again, obviously, uh, you know, the countries that I've talked about are really important. Uh, they understand the importance of an international approach. Uh, but again, they're also looking at how far do we push Putin? You know, if we push him too hard, is he going to go nuclear? Uh, is he going to do something foolish like uh, invade another um, me uh, member state uh, like Georgia or Moldova? Uh, or is he going to invade NATO and stuff? So they're looking at it strategically as to how far can we push? And my answer to this is we've already done it. We've already pushed him. Uh, he has an arrest warrant from the International Criminal Court. He's already a war criminal. Uh, so we've already pushed. Uh, so that's kind of a uh, uh, kind of a weak argument. They're, they're looking for, you know, they don't want to set up the International Tribunal, particularly the United States has challenges because they're a little bit uneasy about what took place in 2003 with uh, with uh, uh, Iraq, uh, but you know, we can't make our decisions based on the past. We have to make our decisions based on the current situation so that we can seek justice. So again, uh, a lot of the major countries are looking at, they're throwing a lot of dust in the air. They're looking at other ways so that they don't push Putin too hard. But at the end of the day, uh, if we set up an international tribunal, I don't see anything happening other than what's happened already when the International Criminal Court bravely stepped forward and issued that arrest warrant for those war crimes related to the children. And hmm. uh, so the, the pure benefit of a, a special tribunal, uh, what would that be in, in just adding on to the ICC um, judgment then? Well, the bottom line is then you have a special tribunal hmm. uh, doing with, dealing with aggression. We have the International Criminal Court dealing with war crimes, crimes against humanity and genocide. And so we're investigating and possibly indicting as well as uh, prosecuting uh, all of the crimes that the Russian Federation has committed against the people of Ukraine. So working together closely, uh, side by side, shoulder to shoulder, with the support of the world's democracies, uh, we can face down uh, this horrific aggression now and forever, because this will send an incredible signal to the likes of China, North Korea, Iran, and other countries who are looking around to do the very same thing. Because if we don't, then China invades Taiwan, North Korea goes south to South Korea, et cetera, et cetera. You see where this is going. All of a sudden, the world's in turmoil because all of the strongmen in this age of the strongmen are watching to see what happens with Putin. If we don't do anything or if we do something that's a, that's, uh, that's doesn't, doesn't do anything against him, a soft measure, uh, then they're going to feel, well, then I can do what I want to do because I will not be held accountable. So we have to. I mean, I can't emphasize this enough, dear friends. We have to do this internationally. Wow. With those powerful words, I think we can take the time to thank you so much for this insightful lecture and the work you do. And we continue to follow the work. And uh, thank you so much for today. Thank you very much. It's been my honor and pleasure. Uh, Newton, uh, thank you also for
creating the event. Uh, dear participants, for the last hour, you participated in the session with Professor David Crane, uh, founding chief prosecutor of UN Special Court for Sierra Leone, founder of Global Accountability, Accountability Network that working on Ukrainian accountability project since the start of the full-scale invasion. And also Professor Crane is a senior fellow of CCL uh, Partner, Public International Law Policy Group. This event became possible because of the uh, research and academic support of PDPG. Professor Crane, thank you for being with us for uh, two years. Last year, you also provided us with excellent analysis, and we will hope to for future cooperation with you till the victory of Ukraine and further. Thank you very much.